right now I'm going to discuss another special case of matrices and how is it how it can speed up your matrix multiplication if you know this matrices well the subclass the special subclass I'd like to discuss today is called diagonal matrices well, for half of the lecture at least and yeah that's the subclass of diagonal matrices so for diagonal matrices we have a uh, express way of writing them and here it is uh, if you write something like this, people will understand you, and that means that you're looking at the diagonal matrix with diagonal entries given here. In, in general, it will be n times n matrix. The rest of the entries will be filled with zeros, but the diagonal ones, they are present in here. So if you want like a standard way of, write, of writing such a matrix, you will be looking at something like this. And your A1, A2, and AN are simply just real numbers. <clears throat> so this is a regular way of writing matrices, but because it has so many zeros, we can make a more efficient notation, and that, that is the more efficient notation for the diagonal matrix. It is not so ubiquitous like between the people who teach the tu tutorials, but still it's a nice notation, and in, in the literature it's a standard way, one of the standard ways to write the diagonal matrices. Uh, I'd like to discuss with you what happens when you multiply another matrix by a diagonal one. Like with the with, like what happened what happened earlier when we discussed with you multiplication by the standard basis vectors, this time it will be some shortcuts as well. So I combine it like this. So I put it in, into different parts. So in part A, I'd like to discuss with you what will happen if you multiply a diagonal matrix, this diagonal matrix in particular by any matrix. So this is my way, this one. This is my way to write a matrix of size N times M, where this capital R1, R2, R3, they just represent rows of that matrix. So you see, uh, this symbol again, it represents a, it represents a matrix a matrix, in, in general, rectangular matrix, uh, n rows and m columns. And I abbreviated the rows. I don't want to write the row like with the components explicitly, just so I, abbre abbre I abbreviated every row with the capital R symbol. Each individual row, it is you can think of it as a matrix of size one row, m columns. Or you can identify this with the simply m-dimensional vector. That's what this symbol means. Even though we just we sort of in the matrix scope, in the matrix realm, you can connect this with the, with the normal regular vectors by just identifying the components. <coughs> so the main thing you should remember when you deal with the diagonal matrices is this. When you multiply a matrix by a diagonal one from the left hand side, like it is here, the result will be simply multiplying every row with a corresponding diagonal entry. I'm not going to prove that for you. I mean, I'll leave it for you to, to verify. It's, it's simple, but rather tedious verification. But the fact itself, I mean, this knowledge of this fact that you multiply, if you multiply a matrix by a diagonal one from the left-hand side, it is simply scaling every row with the corresponding diagonal entry. Knowing this fact sometimes can speed up computations a lot. Similar effect will be when you multiply a matrix from the right-hand side by a diagonal one. This time, the effect will be on columns. That's part B of my slide. If you now look, if you now look at the matrix, which I now, you see, I just gave this matrix a column, column view. So C1, C2, Cn. These are the abbreviating, oh, abbreviations for my columns. So column vectors, C1, Cn, and this time, you see, you can think of these column vectors as matrices of uh, m rows and one column, and you can identify them with the vectors like this. If you multiply a matrix by another one, by a diagonal one, but, but from the right-hand side, this time you will simply scale the columns by the diagonal entries. 
and the size of the matrix will stay. It will be M times N matrix. Uh, well, that's the main things which, which you should know about the diagonal matrices. Uh, one of the consequences of this thing is that when you multiply two diagonal matrices, so when both of them are diagonal, what simply happens is that you multiply the diagonal entries, entry by entry, that's it. So remember one of you suggested when we just first started discussing with you matrix multiplication, he suggested why don't we multiply matrices like we, well, like we add matrices, component by component. And my, uh, and my response to that was you can, nobody can stop you from doing that, but it doesn't represent any interest for the applications and for the industry, for many other things. Well, with the diagonal entrances, the dream of that student it now came true because with the diagonal ones, you multiply entry by entry. It becomes really easy. So I don't have any notes of that on my slide, but probably I'll make that. Uh, let me just do it like this. I'll put it like this. So if, if you multiply two diagonal ones, Uh, if you multiply two diagonal ones, for instance, one with the components like this, and you multiply with another diagonal with the components, say, B1, Bn, if you multiply something like this, obviously they must be of the compa compatible size. That's why we have the same number of elements on the diagonal. The result of this multiplication will be simply... a uh, entry-wise product, so it will A1 times B1, oops, B1, let me, let me make it A2 times B, Jesus, B2, many others, and last one will be An times Bn. It's one of the consequences of these general facts, these two facts which I summarize in part A, in part B. The other consequences, the other consequences. If it is how we find the inverses for the diagonal matrices. Because the multiplication is so easy for the diagonal matrices, inverses will also be easy. You simply invert every diagonal entry. As long as you can do that, and for the numbers you can do it as long as they are non-zero, you can do it for the matrix as a whole. So that's something which I summarize in part C here. The inverse of a diagonal matrix, it's, a, it's another diagonal matrix. It's another diagonal matrix where entries are filled with the corresponding inverses to every original entry. As long as the original entries are non-zeros, you have the inverse. If you have a zero present there, if you have one of the entries or more entries here zeros, then obviously you don't have any inverse for that matrix. Because in that case, you will have non-leading columns in your row echelon form. Remember, diagonal matrix, it is already in the row echelon form. Because every diagonal entry is a pivot of that matrix, unless it is zero, of course. And the proof of that is basically just this identity, because you can, what did I say this? Ah, given that, given that the entries are non-zero, so that's how you compute the inverse, given that this is true. The proof of that is simply one line. You just multiply your D with the D inverse, with the suggested D inverse, in fact, because it's a proof. We don't know yet that the inverse exists. You multiply your D with the D, with the suggested D inverse, and you, you use this for that, this identity we just discovered. And then you have your multiplication, which ends up with the diagonal matrix of all ones, and that is a very good example. We know that the, this is the identity matrix. I didn't say this explicitly, now I say it. Identity matrix, it's a special case of a diagonal matrix, where every entry is one. <laughs>